So, Bob, what a pleasure to join uh, for you to join us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, just if, if people are joining, thank you so much. Please do subscribe. Press below, subscribe, press the not notifications bell. Support us on Patreon if you can. This is going to be a really, really fascinating discussion, and it's going to answer a lot of things that I've been thinking about a lot during the the crisis, but also lots of things I've thought about dreams generally. Uh, it's a it's it's a topic which I think is the sort of thing people often go. You know, I want to know more about this. This is, this is a, an area of mystery. <laughs> yep. So let's just talk first of your book. Let's flash it up. Your book, When Brains Dream, uh, which you've co-written with Antonia Zadra, uh, which is exploring, let's have a look, flash it up. Let's flash it up one last time. Exploring the science and mystery of sleep. Fascinating. So we'll have, what we're going to do, uh, the way in, we're going to talk about people dreaming in the pandemic. Now, this is why it came up. I realized and we've had about a year of the pandemic being around, about 10 months of it consuming a lot of our lives. Social distancing, masks, being locked down. It being constantly on the news all the time. Social media, people's conversations with each other, the Zoom conversations we all have to have like this all the time. And then I thought to myself, why am I dreaming about this? I could barely remember any dreams. So I went onto Twitter, as one does. So the pollster's opinion uh, did a poll about this. And they found that even though the pandemic may feel all encompassing, as Chris Curtis from uh, Opinion found, there's one element of our life it doesn't seem to be creeping into. 12% not applicable. They don't remember the dreams at all. 43% say they never, ever dream about the pandemic. 15% say rarely. And just 15% say some of the time, 7% most of the time, and 3% all the time. But what's interesting is they found an interesting age divide. 18 to 34-year-olds, 64% have had a COVID dream. And that falls gradually down to the over 65s, just 21%. So what I'm asking is, why given, just firstly overall, then we'll talk about the age gap, but why is a general overall picture, given the pandemic is so dominant, why aren't we all just dreaming about the pandemic all the time? So let me turn it back to you and ask, why should we be? Well, because it... I suppose in my head, and this is why I don't understand dreams and why I'm talking to a dream right. expert, right. is I would think to myself that a lot of what we would dream about would be based on our daily life experiences and our brains putting together, you know, that, that our daily life and our daily consciousness must somehow invade our dream world. Yes, but there's a subtlety to it. And, and that's that's what the question ends up being about. So if I were to ask you, how much do you dream about surfing the web how much do you dream about eating meals how much do you dream about driving in your car remember when you used to drive in your car how much do you dream about walking on the streets the answer is almost never even though that takes up the vast majority of your time during the day so it's not just what you're doing during the day that gets into your dreams there's a more selective algorithm the rules that your brain uses to decide what to dream about are more specific than what happened during my day. And what it turns out your brain is really interested in is what's unfinished from my day. Now, very often that's emotional stuff. You have a fight with a friend or you have a fight with a partner or, or you get really excited about something that happened during the day or you're really confused about something that someone said. It's these things that are unfinished in your day. You know, when you go to bed at night, right, you lie down in bed and a whole chunk of the population, they just, like me, they go, and they're out cold. But everybody else, you know, they sort of lie in bed for a while. And what happens? What goes through their minds is everything that they didn't finish, that they need to do tomorrow, that they're not happy with how it turned out, all of these unfinished pieces of business. And that's what we dream about. In fact, probably the reason that our brain, all of our brains, all 8 billion of us around the world are doing the same thing before we fall asleep, which is sort of running through the, the Rolodex to see what's unfinished business from the day is because it's lining things up to work on while we're sleeping. While we're sleeping outside of the dream world and while we're sleeping inside the dream world. So the simple conclusion from your, your survey 
is that yes, people are upset and concerned and paying attention to the COVID question and the COVID dangers, but there's nothing in particular that's unclear. They know they should wear a mask. They know they should wash their hands. They know they should social distance. They know they should try to get vaccinated. There aren't a lot of unanswered questions. I think they'd be more likely to dream about it before Christmas in the US before Thanksgiving, when they're thinking about getting together with family and now there's a concern and there's a confusion. Should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? That's when it's most likely to come up. So I hear you, Bob. However, I mean, driving cars, for example, which I can't do, thankfully, for the sake of not just myself, but the public, but it's quite a mundane activity. Whereas the pandemic is all consuming. It's a, it's a disruption to our everyday lives, which disrupts lots of mundane stuff. So why, for example, why aren't we seeing, I mean, some people are, we'll come on to this, but, you know, people not wearing masks in our dreams or people not making an effort to social distance, that, that never seems to happen. Right. And, and the, the real simple answer to that question is that I and the rest of us dream researchers don't really have a clue why that happens. What's fun about it is it's telling us something. It's telling us something important about the rules that the brain uses to construct our, our dream narratives. It's saying, I don't feel this is something, this is my brain talking. I don't feel this is something that I need to hash out in my dreams. And I agree with you. It, it's surprising that it's so little, but it might have been there a lot at the start. It might be there occasionally. I mean, there was only, well, there was about half the people who said they never dreamt about it. And I have to com comment that I think I'm one of those two. I don't remember any dreams about COVID, but I do have a rather placid attitude towards it, that it's, you know, that for me, it's going to be safe. It's going to be okay. And, and maybe, you know, what's missing from that poll is how angry are you about the people who don't wear the masks? How scared are you about yourself? How scared are you about your family? Um, how confused are you about what behaviors you should or shouldn't be doing, like getting together with people just, just now and then? So I'm not sure. We're not sure yet exactly what those rules are. Most of the time, all we experience emotionally about this is a little anger at those who don't uh, protect themselves and others, um, or maybe anger at those who do protect themselves and others, depending on who we are, um, and a little bit of worry about the risk of catching it, but I don't think that much. And so maybe when these things become long-term and stay at this low level of anxiety or irritation rather than fear and full-blown anger, um, brain decides not to include them. I mean, one, it's really interesting you say that because that, unsurprisingly, your dream expert accords with some of the responses I did get from people who did dream about, who mm -hmm. do dream about the pandemic, who were surprised that other people weren't dreaming about it. And they said they were stuck in a crowded place and people were refusing to socially distance and wear masks. Yes. So there you are, there you are with your un incomplete process and your unfinished business. It's the same thing as it was the question of what should I have done? What should I have done? Should I have left? Should I have shouted at people? Should I have not worried? There's a decision that that person made at the time that they're not confident that they're happy with, right? They're not sure they did the right thing and they're not sure if they know what they should do the next time. I mean, after 9-11, right, in the US, Everybody was walking around saying, I don't understand what happened. But actually we did, that's not what we meant. I mean, a large plane, tens of thousands of gallons of fuel, high speed into a building. We fully understood what happened, but what we mean is, well, for me, I had a flight to Amsterdam in a week, should I cancel it? I work in a 13 story hospital building, should I be going to work? So what we meant when we said, I don't understand what happened is I don't understand how what happened should affect my behavior in the future. And that's the exact example you gave me as a person who's dreaming about it. They don't understand what they should be doing 
in situations like the one they found themselves in. That's when you dream about it. Why is there such an age gap? Because actually there is a profound age gap there. Younger people actually are far more likely to dream about the pandemic and older people aren't. And actually older people are far more likely to suffer the health consequences of the pandemic than younger people. Absolutely. So George, put up the graph. Yeah, come on. Let's hit, that's that's the producer. Let's see the graph. So here we go. 18 to 34 year olds, 64% are only 21% of over 65s. What on earth? Again, I suspect, and I don't know. So first of all, an old piece of data is that the dreams of people get more and more pleasant as they get older. They get less and less anxious. They get less and less fearful. Um, and we're not sure exactly why it is, except maybe it's a mellowing with age. And so maybe that's part of what this is. Maybe it's that with older people, they get it right? They're at risk. There's no question of, oh, I, I'm going to go to this rave tonight. Should I wear a mask to a rave? That sort of feels dorky. I mean, I, maybe I even shouldn't go to the rave, but geez, you know, all my friends are going and they say it's safe. So, you know, so that gives them something to dream about. Unfinished business, a question that has to be answered that they really don't know how to answer themselves. Whereas the old person, the old person, me, the elderly, that was 65 and older, we're hunkering down at home. We sort of understand what we have to do. Yes, we're at risk, but we know what the risk is, right? You don't see people dreaming a lot about getting cancer, even though we all know that risk is there because we don't feel our brain doesn't calculate that there's any decisions that we have to make that we don't know how to make based on the fact that we might get cancer or that we might get Alzheimer's disease and that we might get COVID. I mean, we know how to keep safe. We know how to do the best that we can. And we don't have a lot of questions about what to do. There's no one un unfinished business there for us. Um, in terms of another thing which has come up a lot, at the beginning of the pandemic, and this, this was widely discussed, lots of people had very vivid dreams. This was very widely discussed at the time. Why? Why were people having vivid dreams at the beginning of lockdowns in particular? Well, because my 16-year-old son came into the kitchen one evening and said, Mom, Dad, we're all going to die from this. There was much more confusion, much more fear as to the extent of it, and much less clarity on what to do. I mean, we couldn't get masks. We couldn't get hand sanitizer. We were still going to work. We were still going to school. We we were totally terrified by our lack of clarity on what we should be doing or our ability to do it. I mean, how am I going to get masks? I mean, I was online trying to buy hand sanitizer from, from Amazon. My wife was online trying to get masks. Um, we didn't know what we should be doing. And, and we were scared as much about that as about the danger itself. And so again, I think that's what drives our dreams. It's this, it's these unresolved questions. It's these concerns. It's these anxieties where we think there's something we should be doing or should not be doing, and we're not quite sure what it is. Then the brain has to calculate. Then the brain has to calculate an answer. What should I be doing? Why are we dreaming at all? What's the purpose? Ah. Uh, that's a wonderful question. And I just want to comment that that's a question that's been annoying people for at least 4,000 years now. We can go all the way back to the, uh, to the stories of Gilgamesh, the first recorded stories in history from 4,000 years ago, and they're full of these dream reports. The, the reason we dream is because that's the only way our brain can carry out certain types of calculations. So back up a moment. The last 20 years has seen literally thousands of papers being published on the role that sleep plays in memory processing. In fact, everything that you do during the day, all the memories that you take in during the day are reconsidered during your night of sleep. 
some of them are discarded, some are stabilized so that they won't be interfered with in the future, some are strengthened, some are integrated with older memories, some of them they get a lot of data and they extract patterns. Maybe then after a night of sleep, you hold on to the gist of something that happened and you forget the detail. All this kind of processing happens while, you, while you're asleep. And most of that happens outside of your dream life. What dreaming is, is reserved for is what consciousness at its core during wakefulness is most crucial for. So if I were to ask you a question like, um, what are you going to have for dinner tonight? You actually play a little video in your mind. You actually say, well, okay, I've got this in the refrigerator. And you sort of go, you go through a process. You sort of create a narrative and you sort of see yourself. Okay, I could make that. Oh, that'd be such a pain. Oh, and I don't think I have this. So I'd have to go to the grocery store. And you imagine going to the grocery store and it's not worth it. You'll just do mac and cheese again tonight. Forget about it. But all of these things where you're trying to figure out what to do, you imagine it first. You create a movie in your mind that you watch of what it would be like to do this or what it would be, you know, well, what about if we did that? And it turns out that while our brain can do lots of calculations in the background outside of consciousness, when you step down off a curb, it has to calculate how to change your muscle activity so you don't fall when you step off the curb. You never notice that. You don't have to be aware of it. Your brain takes care of it by itself. But it turns out that if you want to make a decision about a future action, you have to imagine it in your mind. And then what's fun is that what your brain does is it watches you react to it. You say, oh, that sucks. Okay, I'm not going to do that. You have an emotional reaction to this scenario that you create in your mind. And based on that emotional reaction, you either say, okay, that looks good, or no, that doesn't look good. Or you end up sort of more confused. And then you might say, oh, I have to think, I have to sleep on that one. So when you dream, when you sleep, and you want to do that same sort of future projection, you want to consider possible things that you could do in the future. You have to do it within consciousness. That's the only way your brain knows how to make that calculation. And so when you're asleep, your brain has a special state that lets it do a different type of imagining, right? And what your brain does is it goes into your memory stores and it picks out these very weak, distant associations to the question. That's why your dreams are so bizarre. All the straightforward possible solutions you already thought about during the day. This is your brain saying, okay, let's really, let's go outside of normal boundaries. Let's consider, let's consider possibilities that we wouldn't normally consider. And it constructs these, these scenarios, these narratives, these dreams and it pops you down in the middle of your dream and you respond to it emotionally and you think about things and you bring new associations into the mix. And so really it's a way of calculating possible outcomes and their potential value for you. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, what I'm interested in is, so if we don't dream, what happens if, you know, I slept, but because, and, and also, I know this is a widely, uh, it's a widespread myth that we only dream during REM, rapid eye movement sleep, and that's not true. So I'll let you explain that one. But okay, yep. if, we, if we don't dream, what happens to us? If I don't dream for a week, what would happen to me? Or you or anyone? Um, you'd probably be dead. I mean, not from not dreaming, because if you are alive, you dream. It's not a question of whether you remember dreams. So lots of people, you know, Lots of people come to me after a talk and they say, how come I never remember any dreams? I don't think I've remembered a dream in 20 years. And I say to them, well, it's because first, you fall asleep very quickly. Second, you sleep soundly through the night. And third, you wake up in the morning with an alarm clock. And they say, how do you know that? And I say, the only way you can remember a dream is by waking up out of it. 
So lots of people as they're falling asleep drift in and out of sleep and are aware of these little short hypnagogic dreams that we have a sleep onset. Lots of people wake up multiple times during the night and that's a wonderful time to remember dreams. And if you wake up in the morning naturally, just sort of slowly come awake, that's another time you can remember dreams. But if you don't have those opportunities, you won't remember dreams. I tell people, and I'll tell your, your viewers, if you want to remember a dream tonight, three large glasses of water before you go to bed. Okay, I guarantee you, you'll wake up three or four times during the night. It turns out that the most common time to wake up is at the end of REM periods. So you're going to have some good dream recall. The important thing about the function of dreaming, when I talked about this consideration of of these weak and distant associations that might be helpful to you in making these decisions, when it finds those associations and watches you react to them in the dream and, you, and the brain calculates that they're useful to you, it strengthens those associations to be useful to you and available to you the next morning. The brain doesn't care about whether you remember your dreams or not. All the action happens while the dreaming is occurring. So when you ask me, what happens if I don't dream for a week? What you really meant was, what happens if I don't remember any dreams for a week? And the answer to that is, it's just fine. And the answer to the other question is, don't worry, you're dreaming, you're dreaming at least four to six hours every night. If, for example, someone wasn't to drink three glasses of water and maybe imbibed a different sort of liquid, maybe a significant amount of alcohol. What impact does that have? Well, alcohol is a REM suppressant. So you mentioned REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. It is indeed the time of the night uh, when our dreams are most commonly recalled on awakening. They're the most vivid. They're the most bizarre. They're the most emotional. They're the most complex narrative scenarios. So you lose that kind of dreaming if you've been drinking. Now, it turns out that as you go through the different stages of sleep, from sleep onset, in sleep onset, most of your little short dreams, we call them hypnagogic, which means sleep start, um, hypnagogic dreams tend to be short and very strongly and very clearly related to what was going on shortly before you went to sleep. So those dreams are all really probably just involved in, again, tagging recent events um, for, for processing later in the night. When you get into non-REM sleep, which is the majority of your night, the brain seems to process more strongly related associations. So if, you're, you know, if your brain decides it wants to dream about COVID, then during non-REM sleep, you might have dreams about times in the past that you were sick with the flu or people who you've heard about uh, who might have COVID and you'd be weaving those into your dreams. Whereas if you were in REM sleep, you would have much more bizarre dreams and where the association was more distant. What might it be? You might dream about um, how you went to a racetrack and you were gambling and you were uh, you were trying to decide whether you should take risky um, bets or, or, or safer bets. And you might wake up and think that has nothing to do with COVID at all. But in fact, your brain is saying, I have to make decisions about how much risk taking I can afford in relationship to COVID. Tell me about other kinds of risk taking. You know, mm -hmm. how much, you know, you might dream about driving while drunk. You might dream about uh, going rock climbing. You might think about other memories that your brain finds where you made a decision about whether or not to do something risky. So that kind of more creative dreaming, where more creative solutions can be found, is what you would lose without the REM sleep, what you would lose with too much alcohol. Why is it, and two things, kind of two sides of the same kind of coin, but two different, so why is it, most of the time when we dream, we're not aware we're dreaming at all. And actually we can end up believing the most ludicrous and ridiculous things or things like things which cause disappointment. So for example, I don't know, for example, my dad died three years ago. And obviously I've had dreams about my dad 
he's alive. And in my head, he's like, my dad's alive. I believe that. And then you wake up and you realize, actually, my dad is he's dead. And, you know, and then you'll believe not just that, but kind of fanta- fantasy stuff. So that's the one side. So firstly, why do you believe, why are you so convinced most of the time? But on the other is a lucid dreaming. I had a dream the other day, it was really bizarre, where I realized I was in a dream. And then I was like, I need to go and find someone and tell them I'm in a dream. And I ended up in the medical compartment of a train, whatever. Uh, and, and this doctor was rushing around and he was very busy. And I said, no, I need to speak to you. I need to speak to you. This isn't real. I'm in a dream. And he suddenly turned to me and went, you know why you have these dreams, don't you? And I woke up weird. So why is it on the one side, if you could explain that dream, I'd love you to do that, by the way. I'd really love you to explain that dream. Why is it you believe most of the time that this is real, even though it's ridiculous? And why is it sometimes you have those lucid dreams? Okay. First question. Why do we believe that they're real? The answer is because we believe everything is real. I mean, when you're playing a video game and you're deeply into it. You really believe you're in that scenario. You really think your life is at risk. You're really trying to kill that person. I and mean, there's a part of your brain that you know knows it's not, but that also there's a part of your brain that's seeing the room around you and everything in it. You get into VR and you can get very confused. You get into virtual reality games and you really think that you'll stumble and fall if you go forward. You believe you, your brain has evolved, the old expression is seeing is believing. And it's really true. And it's not just when we see things like in video games. I mean, you've seen all these um, optical illusions, right? Where you've got the two lines with the arrowheads at one and the other, and one line looks longer than the other, and you know they're the same length, and you measure them at the same length. And then you look at them again, and you say, yeah, but that one's longer. So. We, we can't undo the belief in what we perceive. And, you know, this is the whole story about people uh, like people with schizophrenia who have hallucinations. And, you know, everybody says, wow, you know, they have these wild hallucinations and they believe that they're real. That's what we do. We believe what we see. We believe what we hear. And it's very, very hard to overcome that if you're in a situation where it's not, in fact, reality that you're perceiving. Why do you get scared when you're watching a scary movie? You're not in danger. But your brain calculates that you're in danger, right? It can't help it. So, so it's, it would be more strange if we didn't believe our dreams because we just believe everything that, that happens in general. Lucid dreaming is the exception to that, and we don't really know why lucid dreams occur except to say that we know that what happens is that the brain becomes sort of split and and portions of the brain, mostly the prefrontal cortex located behind your forehead, um, which is involved in executive um, decision making and things like that, that that which is normally offline while you're asleep has started to come back online. So it's sort of a split brain situation where part of your brain has become awake, literally, um, chemically and and activity-wise, while the rest remains asleep. And so you become lucid. And it's why it's so hard to maintain the lucid state. You often, people who are lucid, describe it as being on a knife edge of either sliding back into delusion and forgetting that you're dreaming or waking up. And it's because half of your brain is awake and half is asleep. And, and you got to keep that balance exactly right to stay in a lucid state. We don't know why it occurs. I mean, we know that people can, can train themselves to be better at it. Um, and and that's, that's, that's a whole nother podcast. Um, but but we, don't, we don't really know why it happens. And it happens rarely for most people. You asked me what your dream is about, I must tell you that whenever someone asks me what their dream means, I always give the same answer. And I say to them, you are one sick cookie. And and I say that because the reality is, I have no idea what that dream was about. And, you know, you became lucid and you became aware that you were dreaming and your brain tried to figure out what that meant and why you went to 
a physician, as opposed to a professor, as opposed to a minister? Who are the authority figures in your life? Who are the people whose answers you trust? Sounds like it's the doctors. Why were you on a train? God knows. What, just a couple of other final things. Recurring anxiety dreams. These do crop up a lot. So I had this recurring anxiety dream. I've not had it for a while, but I have had it a lot where I've basically been sent back to school and I have to do, I haven't done any studying or revision. I'll tell you what the dream is. It's the day of your final and you suddenly realize you've done none of the reading for the course and you've never gone to the classes and you're not particularly scared about the exam so much as you're confused about why didn't I do the reading? Why didn't I ever go to class? Yeah. That's a canonical form of that dream. And I have to tell you, it's, it's in our book. Um, but I went to a series of talks by a, a Brit, um, Bernard, Sir Bernard Katz, who's a Nobel laureate. And he gave four lectures over four days. And on the fourth day, he comes into the lecture hall. There's 300 people in the audience. And he looks out at us and he says, I had that exam dream again last night. And you could just hear the moan in the audience. I mean, for God's sakes, he's been knighted. He's got a Nobel Prize. Why is he still having exam dreams? And the best answer we can give is that each of us in the course of our lives has had a thousand exams starting in first grade and going through college and maybe graduate school. And each one has been a little, what we call a small t trauma. It's been a little bit scary, a little bit worrisome, a little bit anxious. And they all fold into this single mold of exam dream. And somehow all of those memories percolate together and become a canonical representation of our anxiety. Again, notice that the anxiety in your dream is about what you did. And you ask yourself, what can I do now? And it's clear that it's too late to do the reading. It's in fact, too late to do anything. But it's again, this like, what should I have done? What could I have done? And it's just, so there's the exam dreams. There's a, a dream where your teeth are falling out, which I never understood until I watched my kids grow up. And you have what, some 30 odd teeth, 28 teeth that fall out. Each of them are loose for about a week or two, which gives you composite a year worth of loose teeth. Some of which you're stupid enough to have twisted so it got stuck in that twisted position. So again, lots of small T traumas. Lots of concerns about what you're wearing, whether you're wearing the right stuff, and hence all those dreams about going to school or to work undressed or in, in I was about to ask night. you. Yeah, yeah. I was about to ask you about nudity. That was what and I've never had it, but it is a it is a thing. People have their yeah. walking work naked. Yeah, well, you don't look like you spend a lot of time worrying about uh, your sartorial splendor. Oh um, ouch, burned by a jeans sweater. <laughs> wow, there we have it. Well, Bob. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a really mean question to ask you now. <laughs> but so you don't, you're not concerned about that. And you don't dream about it. And, and you don't have all these, you know, I bet you've never shown up at a party and worried about the fact that you were wearing the same dress as somebody else, right? No, that's not. Sartorial <laughs> panic is not something out that, as you can tell, as you have observed, it's something that afflicts me. Um, just one final thing. And I wonder if this yeah. is, it's just it's a, a, a realm of superstition. But I mean, I think it probably is. But some people suggest that things happening in dreams are representative of, you know, are metaphors for things. I can't actually think of one off the top of my head. But there is this thing about objects or things appearing in dreams as metaphors for things happening. Is that just basically horoscope type nonsense? Well, if you if you take it to the extreme of saying that you can make a book and I'm looking on my shelf to see if I can find one of those wonderful books I have of dream symbols where you can open it up and you can see if you dream about your teeth falling out, according to one Chinese dream manual, it means that someone in your family is going to die or you're going to come into money. 
So if you're talking about that sort of metaphorical interpretation, it's all nonsense. Yeah, of course, yeah. But in mm-hmm. fact, insofar as our brains are going out and finding associated memories, so I'm almost in a car accident one day because some bloke runs a stop sign and almost crashes into me. And that night I dreamed that I'm in an amusement park with my son and we're on the bumper cars. And he's having a great time driving around, crashing into everybody. And I'm saying to myself, I, I, this is not, I don't want to be here. You know, I don't, in your dreams, you don't replay your memories. You don't replay your memory of what happened during the day. You dream about what happened. And that almost by definition is a metaphor. Those bumper cars were a metaphor for my anxiety and fear about being in a car accident. And that's real. Your dream about going, being on the train and looking for a doctor to talk to about um, why your dreaming is lucid had to do with your trying to find answers and the doctor was a metaphor for finding answers. Mm-hmm. Um, so on some level, dreams, insofar as they involve the replacement of the memory of the event with a collection of weakly some more strongly related associated memories that you have, that's a metaphorical transformation. And I'm fine with that. It's just when you get into this, uh, 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 that's about you and your mother. Yeah. That's when I say it's all nonsense. Very final thing, because I'm abusing your time now, but I am, I, there was one thing that just came to my mind. Um, I often dream, a lot of my dreams often are based in the house I largely grew up in from the age of six, six onwards in the northern town of Stockport. But I let, my, you know, my parents left that in 2006. I, I almost never dream about being in this flat where I've lived for three years now. Why, why do I keep having dreams based in the place where I spent obviously my childhood, my yes. teenage so, years, when I might, I'm actually 36 now. I mean, come on. I can tell you with absolute confidence that I have no idea why. <laughs> okay, that's one of those things. It's very common. I, I had a, a good friend um, who, who always dreamt of being in one particular house where she and her family had lived for five years, again, 30 years ago. Um, I think your brain just sort of settles on, you know, a background image. It's sort of like if you do a lot of Zoom and you've got a screen that you like to put up behind you. Is that your real background behind you or that is, right? Yeah, this is real. Oh, this is real, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you know those, yes. (laughs) But you know those people who have the the, the faux pictures behind them. They They pick a background. And I think that's what the brain does. I think the brain doesn't care. We did a study. Um, where we looked at people's dreams and we asked them, okay, do you know why this happened in your dream? And they said, oh yeah, this particular thing, I know why it happened. It's because this happened to me yesterday. And I asked them, okay, in your dream, did it happen in the same location as in real life it happened? And the answer was about one time in 10. The rest of the time it was in other locations. So the simple answer is your brain doesn't care where it puts you, it just puts it someplace easy. And I love these occasional dream reports we collect where someone says, I was in the bedroom of the house where I grew up in, although it was actually a ballroom in a large hotel. Yes, that is definitely, so that's very true. Sometimes I know it's my house in Stockport where I grew up, but it actually isn't, that it clearly isn't. Right. Yeah. Right. I, the one I like the best is I was sitting at the turn of the staircase in my house, looking out the window, but I was actually in a fire tower in the forest. Yeah, 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 I get that. So your brain just sort of says, okay, okay. And and very often, you know, it'll come up with a conceptual idea of where you are. And then it grabs an image that doesn't match it and it doesn't care. Funny little thing. Yeah, it, it is. And it's, it's one of those things where the brain's trying to do something. It's busy. It's working hard. I can't be bothered. I can't be bothered getting the background straight. They're fun. Bottom line is that dreaming does what it's supposed to do, independent of what you and your waking life think about it. Um, it does it. It does it well. It produces dreams that sometimes you wake up from and you find 
revelatory. They really wake up and they say, oh my God, that's important. More often than not, you wake up and you say, well, what was that about? And sometimes they're just a lot of fun. And I would urge you to enjoy them on all three of those levels. Bob, it's been a real pleasure. We've gone a real roller coaster tour of the world of dreams. However, if you wish to know even more, and I think we've had a very lucky to have such a dispenser of wisdom on all things dream related, let's slash the book on yet again. There it is. Get yourself a copy. I'm I'm going to get myself a copy because I'm genuinely fascinated. Uh, so thank you so so much for for giving a huge insight into not just pandemic dreams but dreams in general. Sure, and enjoy the book. You will actually enjoy it as much as you would enjoy a really good dream. Oh, oh, wow. Blimey. I might start writing my own reviews for my books as well. No, but that is, <laughs> I'm genuinely, genuinely looking forward to it. I'm sure it's absolutely fascinating. So I, I'll be reading it and I hope you will as well. Cheers, Bob. Thanks. Owen, it's been great talking with you. Great.